Hi, and welcome again to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 2. In the last video, we looked at the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen and helium atoms, and we saw how you can use atomic units to make those equations a little simpler. And as we'll see in future videos, we can use what we've learned to write the Schrodinger equation for even larger atoms, and even molecules. But before we do that, we should talk about how we actually solved the Schrodinger equation. You might have noticed that, although we've talked about the Schrodinger equation and the wave function for atoms like hydrogen, we haven't actually seen how we solve the equation to arrive at the energy. That's what we'll start looking at today. As you know, many equations in quantum mechanics require us to know how to solve differential equations. However, we also saw that as the number of electrons in a system increases, the differential equation we have to solve gets larger. And as we'll see soon, the number of terms in the differential equation increases very rapidly as we look at larger and larger molecules. For that reason, we often don't always use the techniques of differential equations to solve these. Instead, we use the principles of linear algebra, which is the mathematics behind matrices. If you're interested in matrices, you can take an entire course in linear algebra from the math department. It's a great course to take if you want to get into quantum mechanics more deeply in grad school. In this course, we'll mainly be interested in one particular aspect of linear algebra, the mathematics behind determinants. A determinant is a mathematical object consisting of a group of numbers or functions arranged in a grid. The grid is always square, so the smallest determinant will have two rows and two columns, where the rows are horizontal and the columns are vertical. We always show that the grid we're drawing is a determinant and not a matrix by placing a vertical line on each side of the determinant. The items in the determinant are called elements, and if we use generic symbols like these, we usually put a subscript on the elements that shows the number of the row and column they're in, with the row first and then the column. To solve this determinant, we multiply the two elements on this diagonal, and then subtract the product of the elements on the other diagonal. For example, let's solve this determinant. We multiply these two elements, and then subtract the product of these two. Notice that this element is a negative number, so we're subtracting a negative number. It's very common for elements in a determinant to be negative numbers, so you'll need to be careful about the signs of the numbers when you're solving determinants. Anyway, when we solve this determinant, we find out that it's equal to 36. It's also possible for the elements in a determinant to be functions instead of just numbers. For example, let's solve this determinant. Just as in the other determinant we looked at, we solve this one by multiplying these two elements which gives us sine squared of theta, and then subtract the product of these two elements. That gives us sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta. If you've taken a course in trigonometry, you'll know that this is equal to 1. Now let's look at larger determinants. For example, here's a 3 by 3 determinant. Determinants like this one, and larger ones, are more difficult to solve, but we can still do it. In order to solve them, we need to know about cofactors. Each element in a determinant has its own cofactor, which is given by a capital letter A. For example, the cofactor for this element has the symbol capital A23. Let's look at how a cofactor is calculated. For cofactor A23, we first mentally cross out the row and column that the element appears in. To calculate the cofactor, we imagine that the remaining elements are squeezed together to form a 2 by 2 determinant. The cofactor is equal to that determinant multiplied by negative 1 raised to the power of the number of the row and column added together. In this case, that means it's multiplied by negative 1 to the fifth power which is just equal to negative 1. As you can see, this factor will always be equal to negative 1 when the row and column add up to give an odd number, and will always be positive 1 if they add up to give an even number. This makes more sense if we try it with some actual numbers. 
So let's try finding cofactors for some actual determinants. For example, here's the 3 by 3 determinant. Let's calculate the cofactors for these three elements. We'll try cofactor A11 first. We mentally eliminate the row and column that the element is in, which leaves us with this 2 by 2 determinant. The factor we multiply it by is negative 1 raised to the power of 1 plus 1. The determinant is equal to 12 minus 15, and the multiplication factor is 1. That gives us a result of negative 3. Next, we'll try cofactor A23. Again, we eliminate the row and column the element is in, which gives us this 2 by 2 determinant. The factor we multiply by is negative 1 raised to the power of 2 plus 3. So that factor is equal to negative 1. The determinant is equal to 24 minus negative 2. So the overall solution is negative 26. Finally, we'll try cofactor A22. The multiplication factor is negative 1 to the power of 4, which is 1 overall. And the determinant we get by eliminating the appropriate row and column is this. That determinant is equal to negative 24 minus negative 3, which gives us negative 21. So why do we need to know about cofactors? Well, it turns out that the solution of a determinant is given by choosing any row or column in the determinant and multiplying each element in it by its cofactor, then adding them together. For example, for this determinant, we could choose the top row, in which case the solution is given by multiplying the element a11 by the cofactor a11, then adding that to the similar terms for the second element and cofactor and the third element and cofactor. It turns out that it doesn't matter which row or column we choose. Choosing any of them will give the same result. For that reason, it's always a time saver to choose a row or column that has an element that's equal to zero if there is one, since we know that the corresponding term will then drop out of our calculation. Let's try it with a real determinant. Here's the one that we looked at earlier. Let's try to solve it using the second row. We know that the solution of the determinant will be given by this equation. Earlier in the video, we already calculated the cofactors for elements a22 and a23, so the only cofactor we still need to determine is a21. To get that cofactor, we mentally eliminate this row and column. The resulting determinant is equal to 6 minus negative 9, which gives us 15. The multiplication factor is negative 1 to the third power, so the cofactor is equal to negative 15. Now we can find the value of the determinant. It's 2 times negative 15 plus 4 times negative 21 plus negative 5 times negative 26. Again, it's important to be careful about multiplying and adding numbers with negative signs. But if we are careful, we find out that the solution is 16. Again, we would have also gotten the same result if we had chosen to use a different row or column. We'll soon see that determinants give us an easy way to solve complex algebraic equations. They might not seem very easy right now, but they're definitely simpler than some of the differential equations we'd have to solve otherwise. And they're especially easy for a computer to solve, which is what we use for very large determinants. Before we use them to solve equations, there are a few things for us to know about the mathematics of determinants. There are six basic rules to know. First, it turns out that if any two rows or columns of the determinant are identical, then the determinant is equal to zero. So, for example, in this determinant, the first and third columns are the same, so this determinant is equal to zero. The second rule is that if we switch any two rows or columns, the value of the determinant changes sign. 
For example, here's the determinant that we saw earlier, which we saw has a value of 16. If we switch the top two rows, we know that the value of the determinant will now be negative 16. The third rule says that if all the elements of a row or column are multiplied by a constant, the value of the determinant is also multiplied by that constant. For example, this determinant is equal to negative 2. If we compare that determinant to this one, you can see that the only difference between them is that the second row in the new determinant is equal to 2 times the second row of the other one. That means the value of this second determinant is equal to twice the first one, so it's negative 4. If we now multiply the first column by 2, we get this determinant, and we now know that that one must be equal to 2 times the previous one, so it's negative 8. The next rule says that if we exchange all the rows and columns, the value of the determinant stays the same. For instance, here's the determinant that we ended with in the last example. Suppose we make a second determinant. We'll take the first row of the first one and make it the first column of the second one. We'll do the same thing with the second row and the third row. This is known as taking the transpose of the determinant, and the resulting determinant has the same value as the original one. For the fifth rule, suppose we have two determinants, and only one row or column is different between them. In that case, we can then add or subtract the determinants. The resulting determinant will have the same rows or columns that are identical in the two originals, and the remaining row is the sum or difference of the ones in the original. For example, here are two determinants that are identical except for the second column. So if we want to subtract the second determinant from the first one, we can do it by writing a resulting determinant. In this new one, the first and third columns will be the same as they were in the originals. We get the second column by subtracting the middle columns of the original two. That gives us negative 1, 5, and negative 1. If we now actually determine the values of these three, we find that the first determinant is equal to negative 8, the second one is negative 20, and the third one is 12, which is indeed equal to the first determinant minus the second one. The sixth and final rule is perhaps the most useful one, as we'll see soon. This one tells us that if we change a determinant by taking one of the rows or columns and adding it to another row or column, the value of the determinant doesn't change. For example, we've seen this determinant before, so we know that it's equal to negative 8. Now suppose we write a new determinant. The first and third rows will stay the same, but we'll change the second row by taking the third row of the original determinant and adding it to the second row. That makes the second row of our new determinant equal to 1, 1, and 1. If we now calculate the value of this new determinant, we find it's equal to negative 8, just like the original one. I told you a second ago that this last rule is the most useful one. Why is that? Well, remember that a determinant is easiest to solve if one of the rows or columns contains a zero. That's because it means that the equation we use to solve the determinant will have a term in it that's equal to zero, which will save us a little work when we evaluate it. Well, using this sixth rule of determinants, it's usually possible to change one row of a determinant so that it contains a zero. For example, consider the determinant we ended up with in the last example. Now, suppose we rewrite this, keeping the first and third rows the same. We can now change the second row by adding the third row to the second in the original determinant. That makes the new second row equal to 0, 
negative 2, 0. That'll make this determinant much easier to solve. And as we know, adding one row to another the way we just did doesn't change the value of the determinant, so we'll still get the same solution. It's almost always possible to get a zero for at least one element in a determinant by adding or subtracting rows from one another in this way. So, why did we spend so much time learning about determinants? Well, it turns out that they give us a very handy way to solve groups of algebraic equations. For example, suppose we had this group of equations, and we wanted to determine the value of y. Usually, we do that by manipulating the equation so that, hopefully, we could add some of them together in a way that makes some of the terms drop out. But that can be a long process, especially if equations are very large. For example, instead of three variables, as in this problem, we could have seven different variables which would require seven equations. Finding the values of all the different variables would take us a very long time using algebraic manipulation. But the process is much faster if we use determinants. Here's how we do it. Let's look at the simpler example we saw a moment ago. Suppose we want to know what x, y, and z are equal to. It turns out that the value of each variable can be expressed as a fraction. Let's start by calculating x. The denominator of the fraction is just a determinant made from the coefficients of the x, y, and z terms in each of the equations. The numerator is also a determinant. In fact, it's almost the same determinant that we had in the denominator, except that the coefficients on the variable x are replaced by the answers to the equations. So now we just need to find the value of the two determinants. When we do, we find out that the numerator is equal to negative 143, and the denominator is negative 85. So the value of x is 143 over 85. We do the same thing to find the value of y. We have a fraction with a numerator that's a determinant made from the coefficients of the equations, but with the coefficients on y replaced by the answers to the equations. Meanwhile, the denominator is a determinant whose elements are the same as the coefficients in the equations. That means this fraction is 13 over negative 85. So the value of y is negative 13 over 85. And finally, we can find the value of z. The numerator is this determinant, which has a value of negative 69. And the denominator is the same determinant that was in the last two fractions, so it's equal to negative 85. So that means z is equal to 69 over 85. So now we know the values of x, y, and z. We can use the same technique for any set of equations, no matter how large, as long as the number of equations is the same as the number of variables. And best of all, even very large determinants can be solved by a computer much faster than a person can. That's the technique that computer programs use to solve equations like the Schrodinger equation, as we'll see soon. We'll talk more about how we use determinants to solve the equations we've seen in quantum mechanics in the next video. But that's enough new material for now. I hope you'll join me next time, but until then, have a good week.